Hasta le encanta el escribo, ¿no? Hablé tan pensar. A very good morning to everyone. I am Dr. P. S. Party. Head of Physics Department, KLE Societies, KLE Institute of Technology, Hubballi, Karnataka State, India. It's my privilege and honor to welcome today's speaker, a well-known researcher in the field of solar cell technology, Dr. Savant, research professor at Polymer Energy Materials Laboratory, School of Advanced Chemical Engineering, Chennam National University, South Korea, to today's webinar. On behalf of my institution and Department of Physics, I extend a warm welcome to the participants from different states of India and abroad to this virtual webinar. I also welcome our beloved principal, Dr. B.S. Anami sir and Dean Academics, Dr. Sharad Joshi, sir, for the webinar. I welcome heads of all engineering departments, basic science departments, and PhD research scholars of our institution. Once again, I welcome you all. Dear participants, today we are virtually connected for the webinar on perovskite solar cells. Perovskites are a promising material system to make high performance solar cells. They can be processed into thin, light, semi-transparent modules that can achieve high power conversion efficiency, are inexpensive to produce and have high absorption efficiency for sunlight. Because they can be made semi-transparent, Perovskite solar cells and models can also be used on top of silicon solar cells. These tandem cells have a huge potential to boost the efficiency of solar panels and might even prove to the most cost-effective approach to further improve the efficiency of photovoltaics. This webinar aims to address what are perovskite photovoltaics and how they can compete with the current photovoltaic technology. In this webinar, the resource person, Dr. Savant, will enlighten us the latest developments and backgrounds on this technology. I ensure the webinar will be beneficial for everyone present here. Now I request Dr. Sridhar and Matar to introduce today's resource person, Dr. Savant, to the participant. So, what did Matar say? Thank you, sir. A very good morning to all. It is an honor and privilege for me to introduce today's eminent speaker, Dr. Savant S. Mali, to this gathering. Sir has completed his uh, MSc, PhD from Shivaji University, Kolhapur. Presently, he is working as a research professor in Polymer Energy Materials Laboratory, School of Advanced Chemical Engineering, Chonnam National University, Guwanju, South Korea. He has been feathered with many fellowship and award. To mention a few are postdoctoral research fellow at Chonnam National University and DS Kotari postdoctoral fellowship at Pune University. He has published 
more than 200 research article four book chapters more uh, 45 conferences six review article 5914 uh, citations with yet index of 45 he is an expert in perovskite solar cells flexible perovskite solar cells synthesis and study of bhj and um, tandem solar cells di synthesize solar cells quantum dot synthesize solar cells synthesis and study of hybrid solar cells synthesis and study of um, quaternary chalcogenide thin film for solar cell application di synthesize solar cells fabrication of devices carbon nanotube polymer composite for gas sensor flexible polymer solar cells synthesis of metal oxide nano fiber and its application synthesis of cjts cts and jts nano fiber for solar cell application he has also delivered invited talk in china singapore south korea france bhutan and south korea he is here sir has contributed a scientific community with a new recipe for synthesis of various nano material including tio2 zn zinc oxide and cjts p type uh, nickel oxide with a different nano structure and successfully implemented in dssc QDSSC and uh, perovskite solar cells his major achievement are solar cell efficiency of di synthesized solar cells as 7.5% and more than 23% conversion efficiency for polymer solar cells and perovskite solar cells respectively with this brief introduction i request savant sir to deliver the webinar over to you sir हेलो सर हेलो सर हेलो यस सर स्क्रीन इज विजिबल सर आई एम विजिबल एंड ऑडिबल यस यस सर यस सर ओके ओके सो सो स्लाइड्स आर आल्सो विजिबल और इज देयर एनी प्रॉब्लम नो सर एवरीथिंग नो ओके सो शुड आई स्टार्ट यस सर okay thank you very much uh, shridhar sir for nice introduction and uh, first of all i would like to thank uh, the professor uh, basavraj uh, amani uh, prince principal uh, of the college and uh, dr sharad joshi dean of the college and uh, professor ps patil and professor anitha madam for giving me this opportunity to present our research work in your college uh before i start uh, i would like to mention actually i discussed with the shridhar sir and uh, he mentioned please explain uh, basic things because the audience are the undergraduate and master students so i will try to make as simple as possible the perovskite solar cell uh the today's my research uh, topic is stability of unstable perovskite solar cells new strategies for making hybrid and uh, all inorganic perovskite solar cells currently i am working in the chennai national university with professor chanku khong uh, from last 8 years and before i going to start my main research topic i would like to explain what i did in my phd work basically i worked uh, on synthesis of different uh, nano structures such as uh, tio2 or zinc oxide and cjts with the help of the hydrothermal technique and that nano structures has been used uh, for the fabrication of low cost di synthesized solar cell and quantum dot synthesized solar cell and further we used uh, uh, that kind of uh, uh, nano structures for fabrication of large area even uh, we fabricated 5 by Uh, 10 by 10 cm square area for the di synthesized solar cell and with this uh, professor patil's help and uh, our lab efforts we achieved a 7.5% conversion efficiency for the di synthesized solar cell 
and uh, around 3.4 percent for the polymer hybrid based solar cell so this is my phd work and uh, today i'm going to uh, explain the what is the uh, what are the generations of the solar cells and then i will move to the perovskite preparation from per, uh, precursor to the device fabrication uh, then i will focus on the hybrid perovskites uh, how to fabricate the perovskite thin films using the different composition and uh, application of the solvent engineering method then I will discuss which are the electron transporting layer, ETL and HTLs, and how to make the air stable perovskite using the new developer technique. And then I will also discuss some novel ideas like waterproof perovskite solar cell, printable solar cell. And then I will uh, discuss little about the all inorganic perovskite solar cell. That is our current task for upscaling the uh, perovskite photovoltaic technology. And finally, I conclude my session. As everyone know that the currently we need a energy so different energy sources, but the renewable energy sources is really promising uh, promising area. Currently we are uh, currently we need almost uh, 16 terawatt global energy uh, power that we need, and uh, it is projected around 30 terawatt in by 2050. So uh, we we are really need the electricity or uh, energy in in different sources uh, as globally the uh, currently china us and india are almost contributing more than 17 percent energy demand and that energy is uh, basically we are uh, uh, obtaining from the gas renewable energy oil and uh, coal and nuclear energy However, the renewable energy is really uh, promising because we don't uh, we don't have any uh, global house or global warming issues, and therefore people are interested to make the as efficient as possible the global energy resources, renewable energy resources. Uh, as far as the renewable energy sources, there are uh, many types such as wind, uh, wind energy, tide energy, geothermal energy, hydroelectric energy, biomass energy. However, they are contributing a really small amount. And uh, if you check the solar energy currently, currently, I'm sorry, there is something here. Okay. Sir, you are audible, sir. Audible, okay. So currently, uh, uh, if, if we cover all perovskite solar, uh, any kind of solar cell on, whole uh, earth then we will get around 1.2 into 10 to 5 terawatt uh, energy but of course this is uh, not possible and on the land uh, almost 27 percent land we can get a uh, 36 thousand terawatt of course the device should be 100 percent efficient so at least uh, we can uh, we can uh, focus on such kind of renewable energy with the help of photovoltaic technology and uh, basically the conversion of photo uh, solar energy into electric energy the conventional method is to uh, grow the plants harvest them and then burn and then you will get the energy this is the basic uh, solar energy conversion that uh, uh, traditionally we are using but the problem is the co2 emission emission and uh, global warming so another uh, technique is the photosynthesis. The, usually plants are uh, uh, using the photosynthesis method with the help of the chlorophyll and they produced uh, some kind of energy in the valuable products such as ethanol or something we can use. But also that is very less. So we need to, we need to uh, develop the different device that can absorb the photon energy and convert into the electricity. So the easiest way to produce the electricity is the photovoltaics. This is the very first demonstration uh, in 1839. They used some electrochemical electrochemical photocell, and once the light is illuminated, this type of device, such kind of voltage and current was generated. But of course, the efficiency and other things are really really low. Then. The, after 50 years, the this scientist in uh, 1883 he developed some such kind of uh, stacking cell. He used some metal plate which is coated with the selenium and he covered with the uh, aluminium aluminium plate. And that type of device uh, was also showing some kind of photovoltaic effect and produced some electric um, some 
voltage and current. But of course, the efficiency was not good. Then, nearly 70 years later, Bell Laboratory first demonstrated the silicon solar cell. The silicon solar cell, this is the very simple diagram that they published in uh, 1954. So they used a very thick uh, p-type of silicon uh, la layer and uh, which is covered with the n-type semiconductor and then windows layer and they made the p-n junction i will discuss the later but this is the first uh, uh, solar cell they fabricated in 1954 uh, 54 by bell laboratory and this technology now is commercialized and uh, we can get the more than uh, at least a 25 percent power conversion efficiency at the module scale so if you check the community installed uh, solar power capacity globally, so currently we are getting almost 600 gigawatt from the solar photovoltaics. And if you really check the price of the photovoltaic, silicon photovoltaic technology, initially it was really expensive, around $76 you need to pay for the one, one uh, watt, but nowadays uh, it almost a point to three US dollar in 2015. And recently the one of the technical bid was open and the, one of the company, Marubani, he, he they, uh, they quoted the, they can provide the 2.4 cent per kilowatt hour power energy with the help of solar, uh, solar PV. So that means the so uh, solar cell is a really ch uh, cheap technology that we can that that we need to de develop because we we have to focus on the non -re renewable energy in order to uh, remove the or in order to notify the global warming issues so the basic concept is to produce the electricity from the sunlight with the help of the photo uh, photovoltaics solar cells and then we have to store it because the solar light is not 24 hours available and then we can implement it such as a electro uh, electrical vehicles so this is the basic concept actually i am not expert in the battery solar uh, battery but there is a lot of research is going on the battery but in this uh, lecture, I will uh, discuss only the photovoltaics. So based on the different uh, different types, the uh, solar cell can be categorized into, into three major uh, generations, such as uh, first generation contains single crystalline silicon solar cell, second generation, which is a CIJ CDT based, uh, and third generation, we can call it as a building photovoltaics. And uh, this building photovoltaics, uh, really cheap than the conventional uh, conventional photovoltaic. And uh, these uh, building photovoltaics or low cost photovoltaics can be categorized into two different types. One is the organic photovoltaics and the sensitized solar cell. As far as the organic photovoltaics is concerned, uh, they are categorized into th three types, the planar heterojunction, bulk heterojunction, and uh, tandem polymer so solar cell, which is invented by the professor Alan Higer. But of course, the degradation and the efficiency of these devices are very, very limited. Therefore, the people are really interested in sensitized solar cell. In sensitized solar cell, the sensitized solar cell uh, is, uh, can be categorized between, uh, in three different types based on their architecture and based on their absorbing layer. So first one is the disensitized solar cell, which is also called as a Grezel solar cell because Grezel he invented first time. Then the quantum dot sensitized solar cell in which instead of the dye, they are using the researchers are using the quantum dots as a light sensitizer or light absorber. And third one is the perovskite solar cell. This is a really emerging photovoltaic in the, because if you check, if you check the cost wise uh, at the module scale, this is the first uh, generation, uh, first generation solar cell uh, in which the sil uh, silicon, the silicon based solar cell. If you check the cost, this cost is high, also efficiency uh, efficiency is very low. In case of the second generation, especially diacentral solar cell, of course, diacentral solar cell are uh, a low cost, but uh, if you check the efficiency at the module scale, then almost 10 or 12% efficiency can be produced with the help of the diacentral solar cell. Therefore, we need to think the next generation solar cell that can be fulfilled the our cost effectiveness as well as the can be improve the efficiency 
the maybe a uh, few researcher are thinking why uh, this graph shows the more than uh, more than 30% power conversion efficiency of course this is the higher than the shock leak oscillator so the answer is if you if you stack the different uh, different solar cell then the single junction single junction multi junction or uh, multi single double or triple or multi junction solar cell can absorb the particular wavelength and we can produce the different energy uh, different uh efficiency with the help of the stacking of the different solar cell and we can go beyond the 40 percent power conversion efficiency uh before i start uh, the main topic i would like to explain what is the exact uh, exact working principle of the different solar cell here is the two different animations Here, uh, I am trying to explain what is the exact silicon solar cell working principle. Uh, basically, the p-type absorbing layer and n-type absorbing layer, that is the p-n junction they are using, and the p-type layer is absorb the photon energy, and uh, because of the electronegativity, the electron get uh, ex extracted from the p-type and will flow from the external circuit to produce the electricity. This is the basic principle of the silicon solar cell. In case of the diastatic solar cell, the wide band gap semiconductor, nano, nano crystalline semiconductor such as uh, TiO2, uh, TiO2 or zinc oxide, uh, which is uh, deposited on the transparent conducting oxide, we can call it as a TCO, which is loaded with the dye molecules. Uh, the very famous dye is N719 dye that can absorb the visible light. And that device is sandwiched with the help of the platinum or catalytic electrolyte. And once the uh, light is illuminated, such type of devices, the uh, dye molecules absorb the photon energy will, and uh, the, the dye get excited. And because of the energy level, the electron will transport from the conduction or HUMO level, uh, low, uh, level to the uh, dye to the uh, conduction band of the TiO2, and we flow from the external circuit. At the same uh, at the same time, there is oxidation and reduction takes place in the liquid electrolyte. And uh, that kind uh, that kind of device can produce the electricity. In case of the uh, CIGS solar cell, basically the the quaternary chalcogenite, uh, copper, indium, gallium, uh, selenide uh, absorbing layer is deposited on the uh, moly substrate, and then uh, we need to deposit the n-type CDS and zinc oxide in order to extract the electron from the absorbing layer. And in this case, uh, they are using some kind of uh, MGF. MGF2 or MGF as a win window layer. And once we eliminate that kind of device, then the, uh, this absorbing layer, CIGS absorbing layer, absorb the electron, will create an electron hole. And the because of its uh, band alignment and electron affinity, the electron will flow from the external circuit to produce the electricity. Then, as I mentioned, the polymer solar cell, that, that is also one of the building photovoltaic because of its low cost uh, and can be easily processed uh, using the simple solution, solution process. So in this case, the usually the uh, conducting polymer such as P3HT can be used as an absorbing layer where, and the fullerene or its derivative like such as a PCBM can be used as an electron extracted or electron, uh, electron extracted from the, uh, from the uh, polymer layer. So in uh, in this case, once that uh, light is illuminated, the, the the polymer absorber, P3HT absorber, can absorb the photon energy, will create electron and hole, and uh, that creates the exciton. And then because of its electronegativity of the uh, PCBM or fullerene, the electron uh, uh, electron get dissociated uh, electron hole dissociated and then will uh, flow electron will flow from the external circuit to produce the electricity uh, in this case the electron hole uh, dissociated uh, dissociated very effectively but the problem is that th this kind of devices are really unstable in ambient condition and uh, of course uh, the efficiency is also low therefore people are interested to make to make the perovskite solar cell. Uh, this is the very simple uh, schematic uh, representation of the perovskite solar cell. Here, uh, I have used uh, the TCO, that is FTO, which is uh, coated with the mesoporous and compact TiO2 
and that compact AIO2 acts as a electron transporting layer, which is further uh, solution processed. I have used for the fabrication of the uh, perovskite thin films, and we need to deposit uh, the whole transporting layer, which is the p-type. The semiconductor that can transport the hole from the perovskite layer, and finally we need to deposit silver or any other go uh, silver or gold or uh, aluminium as a top contact. If you check the working principle of the perovskite solar cell, the basically the perovskite absorbing layer is uh, the heart of this device, and that can absorb the photon energy and will create an electron hole, and electron will transport from the conduction band to the valence band and because of the band energy alignment and the electron affinity of the TiO2 because this is the n type semiconducting material and uh, because of that the electron will transfer from the conduction band of the perovskite to the conduction band of the TiO2 and will flow from the, uh, will flow to the uh, FTO to the external circuit to produce the electricity at the same time the hole uh, from the valence band to to the HTM or uh, we can call it as a HTL and also flow from uh, will flow to the go uh, gold contact. That means the, the, that device can produce the electricity. This is the simple IV curves and from this IV curve, current voltage curve and from this uh, IV curve, we can calculate the open circuit voltage, whereas the current is, uh, current is zero and uh, short circuit current whereas the voltage is zero from this and with this uh, formula we can calculate the efficiency means how much input uh, you are giving and how much output uh, you are producing that means the photon energy converted into electricity that can be calculated with the help of this with the help of this uh, formula uh, as far as the disensitized solar cell or perovskite solar cell concern the perovskite solar cell is the next generation of the disensitized solar cell Therefore, uh, this is the exact evaluation of the perovskite solar cell. Uh, as, I'm, as I discussed, the, the disensitized solar cell uh, in which the dye is loaded on the TiO2, then they use the elect, uh, liquid electrolyte. But if we replace the liquid electrolyte with the solid state uh, hole transporting layer, such as a spiro MeO TAD, then the, we can call it as a solid state disensitized solar cell. And in this solid state disensitized solar cell, if we replace the dye molecule with the perovskite molecule, then we can call it as a mesostructured or mesoporous uh, scaffold type perovskite solar cell. However, uh, most of the time we don't need this mesostructured, uh, mesostructured uh, layer. And if we remove that type of uh, layer, then uh, we will get the uh, planar type perovskite solar cell, uh, usually the compact TiO2 or SnO2 or zinc oxide or doped metal oxides, uh, wide band gap semiconductor can be used as electron transporting layer, whereas the spiro or other uh, hole transporting or P type semiconducting materials can be used as a hole transporting layer. And this type of configuration called it as a planar type. So so based based on the uh, based on the electron type of the electron transporting layer and type of the hole transporting layer and their position, uh, either it's a bottom or either it's a top. Based on that, the perovskite solar cell can be categorized into four different types, such as NIP uh, mesoscopic. Here the uh, the nomenclature will start from the illumination side because the FTO is the transparent conducting oxide. So in this case, the, the perovskite solar cell uh, or this type of solar cell should illuminate from the FTO side. So once I illuminate the FTO side, the first layer comes the electro, uh, electron transporting layer or ETM uh, such as TiO2. So I, I can nomenclate, uh, nomenclate that uh, perovskite device as N. And because of its ambipolar nature, I, I can mention the intrinsic semiconductor I and then P type layer is comes, that means the P type. So I can call it as a NIP type. If I, uh, if I uh, replace the mesostructure and only I used uh, uh, TiO2, then I can call it as a NIP planar type. In case of the in case of the hole and uh, hole and electron transporting layer, if I replace uh, the replace the electron transporting layer with the hole transporting layer, then perovskite, then electron transporting layer such as PCBM uh, can be used as an electron transporting layer. Then this configuration called it as a PN uh, PIN type, or we can call it as an inverted type perovskite solar cell. 
And also, if we use the nanoporous uh, P type semiconducting, then we can call it as inverted PIN mesoscopic type perovskite solar cell. There are different types of the solar cell. This is the best uh, in a best research uh, solar cell efficiency uh, efficiency with respect to the different uh, uh, different generation or different type of the photovoltaics. And uh, if you check the uh, perovskite solar cell, the perovskite solar cell is currently demonstrating almost 25.5 percent conversion efficiency, which is very within a very uh, very short time as compared to the other generation. And also, if you check the perovskite silicon tandem type uh, efficiency, this, it's almost crossing 29.1 percent. And yesterday only, this efficiency has been increased up to the 29.3. 3%. That means we have a lot of scope in order to develop the uh, photovoltaics based on the uh, perovskite solar cells or based on the perovskite absorber. And uh, this is, as I mentioned, the perovskite, uh, uh, as, as I mentioned, the photovoltaics can produce more than 40% uh, power conversion efficiency. This is because of the, if you use the multi-junction Mm, multi-junction solar cell or we can stack the different uh, absorbing layer uh, different band gap material uh, one layer by layer then we can produce the different voltage and different current that means we can cross shockley causal limit with the help of the uh, stacking or multi-layer multi-junction solar cell so in in case of the perovskite solar cell the current trade is to make the highly stable perovskite with the help of the mixed cations and mixed uh, uh, mixed anion uh, anion based perovskite solar cell and uh, the we have to make it stable moisture uh, air and moisture stable with the help of the different uh, pin and nip structure and finally we have to fabricate the large scale and that device may be uh, can be fabricated either flexible, so we can use uh, any, any any item. So current task is to make the highly efficient perovskite solar cell, which are highly stable and uh, should be flexible. And uh, as far as the commercialization aspect is concerned, the perovskite, uh, any kind of photovoltaic should be highly efficient, flexible, large area, should be uh, waterproof. And that can produce the more than 25% efficiency with uh, more than 25 uh, years stability. Of course, this is an ideal condition, but uh, we can, uh, the perovskite researcher or any other photovoltaic researcher, they are trying to make highly stable and highly efficient solar cell. But the problem is that the perovskite is really hero or villain or just a plain fantasy. The This type of article has been published by uh, Dr. Dev and uh, he mentioned that the perovskite solar cell is really hero because if you check the efficiency progress within uh, eight years, the efficiency is now crossing 29%. That means there is something to uh, something and there is a promising property that can uh, that can uh, that can be used for the fabrication of the highly efficient photovoltaics. Uh, of course, there is a problem with the uh, toxic lead, but if you compare the toxicity with respect to the uh, energy produced and how much amount we used, then I think uh, only two milligram uh, is needed in order to produce the one watt, uh, one watt electricity. But if you compare the the lead used for the battery, automobile battery, that is really twenty pound, that is really very high as compared to the per uh, as compared to the perovskite solar cell. That means the perovskite solar cell. Uh, of course, that is a toxic, but uh, with the amount of lead that we are using is really, really less. If you uh, check the energy payback time of the different photovoltaics, uh, then I can say the perovskite solar cell are really cheap and really uh, very short energy payback time for the, uh, as compared to the other photovoltaics. And uh, of course, the recently the CO2 emission factor for the perovskite is uh, slightly high, but we can recycle the perovskite uh, lead from the perovskite. That uh, that process is also very simple, and people are uh, also using the recycled PB for the fabrication of new perovskite. That means the toxicity th that can that issue can be uh, tackled with the help of this technique. So st starting with the perovskite solar cell. 
the perovskite solar cell uh, is, the perovskite is a name of the scientist and it's a name of the crystal structure the perovskite is a very similar structure as a calcium titan titanate or calcium tri titanium trioxide and uh, the calcium is uh, situated at the center and the titanium at the uh, corner side uh, corner side and the oxygen is uh, is centered so so if i replace the calcium with the the a site uh, general formula is abx3 suppose calcium is a site where titanium is at the base site and oxygen as x site so if i replace a site with the methyl ammonium b site uh, with the lead and x site with the halide then the third uh, third formation third crystal structure form that called it as a uh, methyl ammonium lead iodide or lithium ammonium lead triiodide this is the exact uh, um, nomenclature of the perovskite uh, structure and which is firstly invented by the scientist perovsky uh, and after that all structures which is similar to the this uh, calcium titanate called it as a perovskite structure and in 19 in 1994 the david mirzi he firstly demonstrated the, the this type of structure can be uh, uh, can be metallic or semiconductor based on the different composition and the professor miyasaka he is the one of the japanese scientist he firstly demonstrated the in 2012 the perovskite can be used as a light absorber uh, this is the uh, energy band gap or uh, band structure of the perovskite here the p type uh, uh, p uh, pb uh, p orbital uh, is contributed for the formation of the conduction band while uh, halide p orbital and uh, pbs orbital is contributed to form the valence band and because of its strong light absorbing ability in the visible light and it has a tunable band gap with low exciton uh, dissociation energy and low defects, the perovskite uh, solar cell can produce the nearly equal open circuit voltage uh, as, uh, as its band gap. So uh, initially, the, this uh, scientist, scientist well, he used uh, some cesium lead uh, halide, cesium, uh, cesium lead chloride, bromide, and iodide uh, as a perovskite structure, but that time he didn't uh, study any kind of uh, photovoltaic application. Then uh, the scientist Weber, he used, uh, instead of cesium, he used a methyl ammonium and uh, methyl ammonium lead halide. He, uh, he fabricated lead chloride, lead bromide, and lead iodide. And also he replaced uh, mid, uh, lead by the tin and uh, the one is the lead based perovskite so, uh, perovskite composition or perovskite structures and thin based perovskite structure he fabricated but that time he uh, didn't uh, study its uh, photovoltaic properties and as i mentioned before the david mirzi he synthesized some uh, some oriented 001 plane oriented perovskite sheets with the help of uh, this uh, composition with uh, tin and this uh, he studied the that kind of structure is semiconducting or uh, metallic behavior and in uh, 2000 uh, the, in 2002 the, the professor miyasaka and kojima he they used uh, uh, some kind of methyl ammonium lead bromide uh, composition. They used some solid state reaction and uh, fabricated the uh, similar diastatic solar cell, uh, diastatic solar cell configuration. And that time they demonstrated 2.1% efficiency. Of course, this efficiency is really low. But uh, this is the first demonstration that uh, this type of configuration or this type of structures can be used as a light absorber. And after that, uh, after that, uh, in 2009, he used uh, lithium, uh, methyl ammonium uh, lead uh, bromide and lead iodide. They, he used the two composition with the help of the solid state reaction. And uh, he demonstrated 3.8% con power conversion efficiency. This he is the he therefore he is the uh, pioneer in the perovskite research area and uh, these are the four leading scientists nowadays the, uh, these are the four leading scientists uh, 
uh, in the perovskite uh, photovoltaics. Uh, after the in uh, first report by the Professor Miyasaka Nangyu Park, he again used a similar uh, quantum uh, quantum uh, similar uh, quantum dot and diastasis or combined uh, concept. Actually, he synthesized uh, perovskite quantum dot and used for in, used in the diastasis solar cell. Uh, uh, type the Dyson type uh, application, and that time he reported 6.5 percent conversion efficiency. After uh, two years, the professor Gretzel he used uh, instead of the liquid uh, light because the Nangyu Park reported the 6.5 percent conversion efficiency, but the efficiency that devices are not stable and that degrade within a 30 minutes, as he many times uh, mentioned about this uh, degradation issue. So the professor uh, Gretzel, he used uh, instead of the liquid electrolyte, he used a solid state HTM and he used a thin layer of the mesoporous TiO2 and which is coated with the methyl ammonium lead triodide or I can call it as MAPBI3 perovskite. And uh, uh, that time, uh, this type of uh, solid state diastasis solar cell or a solid state perovskite solar cell demonstrated more than 15% power conversion efficiency, which is reported in July 2013. And within a two, uh, two months, the Professor uh, Snaith, he used uh, some kind of dual thermal evaporation technique. That means one, one source he used a methyl ammonium iodide and another source he used a lead iodide. And simultaneously, he, uh, he uh, thermally evaporated uh, on the electron transport delay and fabricated devices shows the more than 15% uh, power conversion efficiency. That means if you check the uh, progress within four years, the efficiency has been increased from 3.8% to the 15%. That means the uh, perovskite solar cell is really a uh, red hot topic in the photovoltaic industry. And therefore, I, I uh, published this paper uh, with the title, once again, organic metallic trihalide perovskite. This is a really new and nearly breakthrough in the uh, photovoltaic, uh, low cost photovoltaic technology. The perovskite solar cell is a very simple technique. The, we have to deposit the uh, N type uh, electron transporting layer on the FTO or TCO substrate, then you need to deposit the perovskite layer uh, with the using some modified chemical process. And then finally, device can be uh, completed with the whole transporting layer and the uh, gold. So basically, the compact TiO2, mesoporous TiO2, perovskite, and whole transporting layer that can be processed using a simple uh, spin coating technique. And the contact, the top contact like aluminum or gold or silver can be deposited with the thermal evaporation. So this is a very simple uh, device architecture that we can produce the electricity from the light. As I mentioned, the perovskite has a general formula ABX3, where uh, A site, uh, A site, B uh, A site cation, B site cation, and X are the halide. And we have a lot of uh, options, a uh, lot of A site uh, cations, B site cations, and X site halides. So uh, if I use if I use A site as a methyl ammonium, uh, such as MA, B site as a lead, and X site as a iodine, then the perovskite structure can be called it as a methyl ammonium. Uh, uh, methyl ammonium lead halide or MAPBI3. This is the short form. If I replace with the uh, A site with the FA and B site with the tin and uh, X site with the bromine, then I can call it as a FASNI3. FA this is the lead free perovskite, and uh, we can call it as a uh, FASNI3. FA uh, and there are a lot of A site, uh, A site cations, B site cations, and with the help of the different uh, additives, different uh, A site, B site uh, cations and halides, we can tune the more, uh, we can tune the band gap of the uh, perovskite from the UV region to the NIR region. Therefore, we can control, we can we can control the any type of the band gap with the help of the different cations and absorb the photon energy or solar spectrum effectively. Therefore, the perovskite solar cell are really efficient. There is another type that is class, uh, another class, uh, class is uh, lead-free perovskites and uh, 
also that can be categorized into different types such as double double perovskite or triple perovskite but i am not expert in this area but uh, is perovskite researchers also working in that uh, type of uh, uh, that type of the photo uh, perovskite in order to improve their efficiency as well as the stability so basically we are working in the different types of the electron transporting layer hole transporting layer and we are trying to make the highly efficient uh, highly efficient uh, highly stable uh, and highly uh, air stable and thermally stable perovskite solar cell with the different uh, different uh, recipes so basically the perovskite solar cells contains tco electron transporting layer uh, the perovskite absorbing layer and uh, hole transporting layer then contact and then finally testing as i mentioned the perovskite is a ambipolar in nature that means the perovskite uh, can be used either in pin type or nip type so if you replace the if you exchange the etl and htl then you will you can categorize the, uh, the perovskite solar cell in different uh, types and that time we reviewed uh, the different class uh, different types of the perovskite solar cell uh, based on their uh, electron uh, etl and htl uh, composition htl position and that time we predicted the perovskite uh, with the help of the perovskite uh, solar cell uh, with the help of the perovskite composition and with the help of the different etl and htl the more than 25% efficiency can be possible and uh, i am really happy that uh, last uh, week last month only the one of the korean com, uh, korean research uh, group and uh, with the help of the mit they reported that more than 20 uh 5.5 percent uh, power conversion efficiency for the single junction solar cell that means uh, we our prediction was really uh, in right direction so if you fabric if you want to fabricate the perovskite solar cell you need to do, you need to develop the different types of the etl uh, such as tio2 zinc oxide or doped zinc oxide uh, basically we are using some chemical process um, chemical process for the fabrication of the etl also hydrothermal process we you we are using and some kind of electro spinning technique that i am going we are also using in case of the perovskite uh, uh, perovskite precursors we are preparing using the rotary operation technique uh, perovskite uh, precursors such as uh, ma mai mabr fai fabr and uh, we are using the uh, lead halide as a commercial available uh, chemical and in case of the whole transporting layer uh, we are uh, we are synthesizing the different types of the uh, htm such as spiro meotd uh, pta and uh, recently we are focused on the modified carbon based whole transporting layer which is a really low cost and uh, also inorganic perovskite and non doped uh, p3ht based perovskite uh, uh, non doped p3ht based whole transporting layer in case of the device completion we are using the aluminum silver gold uh, and uh, calcium uh, calcium silver bilayer uh, top layer in order to improve their work function and improve the efficiency of the solar cell so as i mentioned this is the uh, typical energy level diagram of the perovskite uh, solar cell here the we uh, we used uh, different types of the electron transporting layer uh, we are uh, currently we are working in the this type of the perovskite absorbing absorbers and the um, we also used the different types of the spiro based uh, pta based p3 based htm and uh, our main uh, main target is to make the highly stable highly efficient and hysteresis free uh, perovskite solar cell with the help of the unique composition of the organic or inorganic perovskites uh, with the help of this we uh, fabricated in june 2013 the very simple uh, simple device structure which is a deposit with, which contains the mesoporous tio2 perovskite absorber and hole transporting layer and that time this type of device shows 11.8% power conversion efficiency for spiro and uh, for the pta we achieved 14% this of course this efficiency is not uh, high but uh, that time the that time the efficiency this efficiency in 2013 is really competitive then uh, 
uh, we used as some simple uh, hydrothermal technique. We grown the TiO2 nano rods on the FTO substrate, and that uh, nano rod based uh, ATL has been used for the fabrication of the periscite solar cell. And this type of uh, uh, work has been published, uh, but of course, this uh, for the first publication, uh, it took almost 1.5 years. That means the perovskite uh, solar cell research area is really competitive and uh, really uh, growing fastly. Uh, then we synthesized uh, different nanostructure of the TiO2 uh, with the help of some itching technique. And uh, if we use the, some hollow structures of the TiO2 nano rods, then we can improve the efficiency from the 15% to the 17%. But this is based. Uh, this is based on the different types. How to improve the efficiency of the perovskite solar cell? This is really, uh, really critical things. We you have to optimize the type of the hole transporting layer, uh, electron transporting layer, which band gap or which composition you are using. That is also matter for the uh, for the making the highly efficient solar cell, and which crystallization growth or which. Uh, uh, how the crystallization is process is going on that also decide the morphology of the your perovskite thin pimps which additives you are going to use which methods and which passivators uh, you are going to use that factors affects on your efficiency as well as the stability so this is the very simple technique as very simple spin coating but anti solvent based uh, uh, technique that developed by professor sir that i am going to demonstrate here. So here, uh, this is the simple conventional uh, spin coating technique here. I'm sorry for this trouble. Uh, so here, uh, this is the conventional method. Uh, just uh, I prepared the perovskite solution and poured on the uh, transparent conducting oxide with the TiO2. And in this case, while the spinning the substrate, I poured the anti-solvent such as chlorobenzene or uh, toluene. And uh, you can easily check the, the color has a uh, color of the spinning substrate is dark getting dark. So that means the that means the anti-solvent method can control the crystallization. And if you check the photographs of the both the sample, then the conventional sample is really whitish in color, while the anti-solvent based sample shows really dark in color. So if you check the surface morphology of the conventional anti-solvent method, then we found the randomly oriented uh, grains. But if I use the anti-solvent method, then we found very highly uniform uh, perovskite thin pins, which is uh, uh, which produces more than the 15% per cover, power conversion efficiency. Here we used some uh, uh, sputtered TiO2 on the flexible substrate and uh, we used as an ETL and that kind of devices also shows more than uh, 15% power conversion efficiency. That means that we can fabricate the flexible solar cell with the help of this uh, simple uh, spin coating, anti-solvent based spin coating technique. Then we uh, used uh, some uh, nanofiber based uh, electron uh, electron transporting layer, TiO2 nanofibers we used, but we here we Im, uh, embedded the gold nanoparticles in the TiO2 nanofiber and their devices also will work very well and which with the uh, with the 15 per 15 percent power conversion efficiency then uh, as i mentioned the perovskite solar uh, perovskite thin films can be deposited with the help of the anti-solvent method then uh, i used some mixed compositions such as fapbi3 plus uh, mapbbr3 which is the very uh, very popular nowadays and uh, uh, this per perovskite composition were deposited with the help of the anti-solvent technique. If you check the crystallization photos, then the this is the conventional method. CRP means the conventional method. Um, SRP means single retarding process and uh, DRP means dual retarding process. That means here initially I have used uh, only PBI2 precursor and fabricated the perovskite thin beams. Then 
I uh, fabricated the PBI2 DMSO complex with the help of some chemical recipe. And that uh, PBI2 DMSO complex has been used for the fabrication of the perovskite thin films. And this is the in situ annealing uh, photographs. Then you can easily check the crystallization uh, period has been extended up to the 16 second. That means that means the PBI2 uh, DMSO complex is retarding the crystallization, uh, retarding the reaction between the API cations and the PBI2. PBI2. So uh, again, I have synthesized the nitrogen doped graphene oxide and um, uh, dispersed in the perovskite uh, uh, perovskite precursor, and that precursor used for the fabrication of the perovskite thin films. And then you can easily check the crystallization process as also uh, delayed with the help of the nitrogen doped uh, graphene oxide. If I check the morphology of the three samples, that is conventional retarding process means anti-solvent, then with the help of the PBI to DMSO complex and with the help of PBI to DMSO plus NRGO, uh, NRGO additive, then the morphology has been improved dramatically for the di uh, for the dual retarding, uh, retarding process. And if, if I check, if I check the efficiency of the of the three composition, the efficiency of the conventional uh, sample shows 14%, which is improved up to that 20.3%. That means the this type of crystallization, controlling the crystallization, is uh, positively affect on the efficiency and the, the it can boost the efficiency from the 14 to the 20%. This is a really uh, really uh, high improvement. If I check the TRPL analysis, the TRPL analysis shows the DRP sample uh, uh, shows very uh, longer lifetime as compared to the conventional retarding process. That means this uh, crystallization process also helpful for the uh, reducing the defects in the perovskite thin films. Then I synthesized some uh, gallium doped uh, gallium doped TiO2 compact layer and uh, used it for the fabrication of the perovskite thin films. Then if you check the uh, surface morphology of the different ETLs, uh, this is the conventional TiO2, and I have used a gallium doped uh, TiO2. Then morphology and the grain boundaries has been uh, has been reduced, and morphology has been improved, which is which results in the more than more than 90% power conversion efficiency. That means the electron transporting layer, our electron mobility of the TiO2, our ETL is also playing a critical role, uh, role in order to improve the efficiency of the perovskite solar cell. Then, I, uh, as I mentioned, based on the, the, the position of the uh, electron transporting layer and hole transporting layer, now we can categorize uh, different config, uh, we can categorize the uh, perovskite solar in different uh, types. But in case of the PIN type, uh, the PIN, uh, PIN inverted configuration can be categorized into four different types. Uh, here the planar inverted, uh, then metal oxide based, uh, then two metal oxide based uh, meso structured, and uh, then metal meso structured metal oxide based uh, HTL and ETL. So uh, initially I will start with the type second. Here I have used uh, nickel oxide. Basically, the P dot PSS can be used as a whole transporting layer. But P dot PSS is not a stable material because uh, it degrades seriously uh, in ambient conditions. So instead of the metal, uh, instead of the uh, polymeric hole transporting layer, uh, we use the nickel oxide, which is highly stable in ambient condition and uh, which is uh, uh, which is used as HTL and deposited on the ITO substrate. And the perovskite absorbing layer is deposited with the help of the anti-solvent method and device is completed with the PCBM as an ETL. And that device is also produces more than 15% power, power conversion efficiency. That means uh, the nickel oxide can be used as a whole, uh, promising whole transporting layer in the perovskite solar cell. Therefore, we, uh, we decided to use some nanostructured uh, nickel oxide and I have used uh, uh, simple uh, chemical co-precipitation method for the synthesis of the nickel oxide. This is the uh, same images of the nickel oxide, nanoporous nickel oxide, which is de deposited by simple co-precipitation method. And if I used uh, that type of hole transporting layer, 
then we got almost 19.1% power power conversion efficiency which is really uh, really high uh, really high in uh, this type of uh, this type of inverted mesostructured uh, or mesoporous type configuration and uh, this at that, that time this paper was really uh, really uh, famous and that uh, paper has been covered by the different uh, uh, media houses uh then uh, this is the simple uh, structure as i uh, mentioned before uh the spiro based uh, this is the very uh, common uh, hole transporting layer can be used but but the uh, this uh, spiro based uh, uh, hole transporting layer is really unstable in ambient condition and the preparation of the this spiro based htm is really complicated you need to deposit some kind of the you need to add some kind of the litfsi and uh, tbp additives and that is very tricky so instead of the uh, conventional uh, conventional spiro based htm we decided to use some kind of the uh, inorganic low cost uh, low cost uh, htl such as copper thylacinin if i check the price of between the conventional htms and uh, uh, copper based htms then the spiro based uh, sample is uh, spiro based htms are really expensive it is almost 500 us dollar but uh, the cusn based uh, htls are really cheap 2 us dollar per gram that price is really cheap but the problem with the uh, the cusn based htls are uh the uh, cus uh, sn uh, inorganic htls uh, only dissolve in uh, diethyl or polar diethyl uh, sulfide which is seriously affect to the perovskite uh, perovskite layer that perovskite layer degrade uh, very quickly with in presence of the this type of the uh, this type of the polar solvent therefore we decided to use uh, alternative uh, inter interlayer between the htm and the perovskite Uh, perovskite layer and here we choose uh, the nickel oxide which is doped with the uh, cesium because the cesium can improve its uh, whole mobility and uh, we inserted the cesium doped nickel oxide uh, between the copper uh, thylacinin and uh, perovskite uh, layer uh, means the before deposition of the copper thylacinin we used uh, we deposited cs nickel oxide in the chlorobenzene solvent and interestingly that devices also shows 19.2% power conversion efficiency uh, if i check the thermal stability of course the conventional spiro based uh, htms are not thermally stable but the copper uh, thylacinin based uh, htls are really uh, thermally stable and if i monitor the device stability under uh, 85 degree centigrade thermal st stress then that uh, devices are really stable over uh, 150 hours and also we check compared the stability with the different hole transporting layers and i believe that the, our modified cs nickel oxide with the copper thylacinin based htls are really stable and shows more than 100 hours stability at 60 degree thermal stress so this paper is uh, also published in the materials today then i Uh, as i mentioned copper thylacinin can be used for the fabrication of the low cost perovskite solar cell uh, then i used a simple this is a simple humidifier humidifier that we are using in the winter so that can produce the mist uh, water mist but instead of that i i uh, i thought that can be used for the uh, spraying the perovskite uh, htl solution htl solution on the perovskite so i used uh, this type of the simple uh, low cost uh, uh, spray or humidifier for the deposition of the hole transporting and i used uh, also reduced graphene oxide in order to protect the gold diffusion uh, gold diffusion from the top to the perovskite layer and that devices also exhibit more than 19.5% conversion efficiency so uh, i can say the perovskite solar cell can be fabricated with a very simple techniques if i check the stability of the both the sample the conventional spiro based as i mentioned not stable at the thermal uh, with the thermal stress uh, but uh, if i use the cusn rgn based that devices are stable in the ambient condition 
also we have fabricated the one by one large area of, uh, device uh, which which shows almost 18.3% conversion efficiency that means the technique can be uh, upscale at the large area but the problem is that as i mentioned most of the previous our work is based on the ma based uh, ma based uh, perovskite but the ma based perovskites are really sensitive to the heat moisture and light they, they are seriously degrading and uh, forms the non perovskite composition, which is a non photoactive in nature. Therefore, people are interested to make the FA based uh, perovskite, FA based perovskite, which, uh, uh, which can call it as a FA PBI3, which shows uh, 1.47 electron band gap, which is lower than the FA. That means, that means uh, we can uh, also of the photon energy solar spectrum from the solar spectrum very effectively therefore i used uh, this composition and i added uh, some rubidium in order to stabilize the perovskite uh, precursor and uh, improve the stability and i reduced the uh, methyl ammonium uh, content in order to improve the stability and uh, we used some different types of the whole uh, different types of the whole transporting layer and uh, we used the different types of the anti solvents such as anisole chlorobenzene and tolium and we found that the this uh, reduced uh, reduced methyl ammonium triple uh, cation based perovskite uh, are really stable more than 200 hours stable uh, in an ambient condition here we used some p type of uh, p type uh, pta based lhtl that uh, that can be used for the stabilize the perovskite uh, in ambient condition but of course the the pta and spiro based uh, htls are really uh, expensive so how about the printable perovskite solar cell can we really make the printable solar cell and the answer is yes uh, here we used a simple uh, blade coating technique for the synthesis of the mesoporous ti2 and uh, which is loaded with the perovskite this uh, here we used a spin coating technique and instead of the whole transporting layer, uh, instead of the whole transporting layer, we used uh, a carbon based uh, with uh, some kind of methyl ammonium addit additives. And that uh, carbon paste has been deposited on the perovskite layer. And that device is really working. If I check this uh, device efficiency, the device efficiency of the device uh, of the carbon based device shows more than uh, more than 12% efficiency. And uh, the, if we check the ambient stability, ambient stability of the uh, this device is this is really high, really high compared to the conventional uh, conventional spiro based uh, device. And uh, actually, I used these devices, the carbon based uh, whole transporting uh, HTM based devices used for the waterproof uh, analysis. And uh, I flush this device under a tap water. And I exposed uh, directly to the water for many times, but the carbon-based uh, uh, carbon uh, perovskite solar cell really st stable even I exposed seven times with the water. That means we can make the waterproof perovskite with the help of this, uh, uh, with the help of this method. Uh, in case of the spiro, these devices are uh, not really stable in ambient condition. And if, if I expose to the water, uh, then that, that that device spiro based device degrade very quickly this is the demonstration that uh, we fabricated the carbon based uh, uh, carbon based uh, uh, perovskite solar cell and which is stable in ambient condition we checked the uh, more than uh, one eight, 160 days that means more than 3 6 months we just uh, studied the stability but that devices are really stable you can easily check the this uh, fan is connected with the very small one by one centimeter square uh, area of the perovskite solar cell that we connected directly to the fan and that can produce the electricity. Okay, so based on this concept, I I, uh, I I tried to make the alternative carbon. Uh, alternative carbon. So we here we used uh, some aloe vera paste. Uh, aloe vera. This is a very simple uh, Indian traditional method to make uh, the carbon. Uh, we can call it as a kajal. So that ca that carbon used uh, for the 
that carbon is synthesized from the aloe vera and if i check the uh, pm images of the that uh, synthesized carbon so we found some cross linked nanoparticles from the aloe vera and that uh, that carbon uh, powder or that carbon nanoparticles i have used for the synthesis of the carbon paste uh, carbon aloe vera uh, uh, aloe vera based carbon paste with the mai content and used and uh, deposited uh, or screen printed on the ftf substrate with the triple layer structure initially i deposited meso structure meso porous tio2 uh, by screen printing then jhadaro2 by screen printing and then printed the uh, carbon based paste and the perovskite is uh, inflated with the uh, just a simple drop casting and if i check the device performance that simple technique also produces very good efficiency this 12.4% uh, efficiency we got uh, that is really good for this uh, very rude met uh, very crude method so i think we can produce the very cheap uh, perovskite device with the help of the this technique and if i check the stability of the both the devices uh both the devices the conventional i compared with the spiro based device and uh, our modified method the modified method shows low efficiency uh, 12% efficiency but the if you check the stability the devices are uh, stable more than 900 hours with very small uh, decrement in its initial efficiency and also we used some uh, artificial humidifier in order to check the humidity but uh and interestingly the, the that devices are also stable in very high uh, humidity uh so, so this type of uh, work we uh, reviewed in this paper so anyone interested then they can go through this so the next topic is uh, as i mentioned the organic cations are not stable so people are trying to trying to replace the uh the organic site the fa fa site uh, a site with the total uh, inorganic so if i replace the fa site with the cesium then third form a third configuration will form a third perovskite configuration will form that we can call it as a all inorganic perovskite solar cell and uh, especially the cesium based perovskite solar cell that we are going to uh, stabilize but the of course the cs uh, pbi cs pbx3 based perovskites are uh, really thermally stable but the problem is that the cs pbi3 composition is stable only at a high temperature and it's continuously transformed into the cubic or uh, perovskite uh, phase to the non perovskite delta phase so the uh, the current challenge is to make the highly uh, thermodynamically stable uh, inorganic perovskite solar cell in order to transport uh, in order to uh, terminate the transformation from the alpha phase to the delta phase and improve its uh, thermal uh, improve its the phase stability as well as improve its uh, efficiency so based on the different different uh, iodine and bromine composition cspb i3 uh, i3 composition cspb x3 composition can be categorized into four different composition one is uh, one is the cspb br3 we, that means the iodine is totally absent one is the cspb i3 the, the here is the bromine is uh, bromine is absent however if we check the band gap of the all three all four composition the brom cspb br3 shows 2.3 electron volt which is a really wide uh, that that covers only small so, uh, solar spectrum so these solar cell are of course highly stable but uh, not produces the highly efficient uh, highly high efficiency there if we check the cspb i3 these are the uh, ideal band gaps i mean uh, solar friendly band gaps but these perovskite these perovskite composition are not stable uh, in ambient condition therefore uh, we are trying to make uh, the partially replace iodine with the bromine and uh, the new form new composition will form that is called it as a cspb i2 bear which is highly stable uh, thermally uh, thermally of course thermally stable but uh, also we need to make the hum uh, highly stable in uh, air as well as in high humidity 
atmosphere. So people are trying to make the different uh, deposition technique in order to improve and different metal and dopant in order to improve the uh, in order to improve the its stability as well as the efficiency of this composition. Then we decided, as I mentioned before, the crystallization process is uh, seriously affect on the morphology as well as the uh, device performance. So here I have used a simple here I have used a simple dynamic hot air method. So instead of the instead of the anti solvent, I have used uh, some dynamic hot uh, dynamic hot air, and this sample you can easily check the without without hot air or without uh, without uh, anti solvent the sample is brownish in color but if i used uh, if i used uh, our dynamic hot air method then the you can easily check the morphology uh, the compactness or darkness of the sample has been improved a lot that means uh, the morphology of the sample is also uh, good if i check the morphology of the both the samples this is the without hot air or we can call it a conventional method and this is our dynamic hot air method so the morphology or compactness of the sample has been improved and if i check the cross section of the um, sample then the dynamic uh, without hot air sample shows the really uh, non uniform film thickness and uh, if i check the dynamic hot air processed sample the you can easily check the highly uniform perovskite thin films has been deposited on the TiO2 and that will helpful to to make the good interface between the ETL and HTL and that devices produces the 14.8 percent power conversion efficiency which is really high as compared to the um, conventional method and here we used uh, some uh, barium uh, we replaced the PB site with the barium in order to improve its stability these are the analysis that we can conclude the PB uh, PB is partially replaced with the uh, barium uh, barium cations, and this technique also used for the fabrication of one by one centimeter area device. And that large area devices also exhibit more than 13 percent power conversion efficiency. That means uh, the dynamic hot air method can be used for the fabrication of the large area. And also, this technique is free from the hazardous uh, anti solvents such as toluene or chlorobenzene free from that anti solvents so uh, we can produce uh, uh, the devices uh, well, with the help of the dynamic hot air method so uh, again we uh, instead of the barium we partially replaced the pb site with the europium and indium and we varied the our hot air temperature from the room temperature to the 200 80 degrees centigrade and we found that the 150 degrees centigrade is the most promising temperature for making the highly efficient device that means the optimum uh, heat flowing is uh, useful for making the intermediate phase and that control the crystallization uh, process and if i check the device uh, efficiency with respect to the uh, with respect to the hot air so 50 uh, 150 uh, 150 uh, hot air temperature is good and that produces 17.4 percent power conversion efficiency at the small area and uh, if i used a large area then the device also shows 15.8 percent that means uh, we if we replace the uh, pb site if you if replace partially the pb site with the different cations then we can make the highly efficient and highly stable perovskite solar cell uh, and especially these are the uh, all inorganic which is processed in the air so we can we don't need any kind of glow box to fabricate a uh, uh, perovskite solar cells if i check the stability of the both the samples uh, i mean uh, i compared the conventional sample and conventional method with the modified method with the modified composition then i believe that the cspbi 2 br with europium or with indium uh, doping will improve the uh, efficiency as well as the stability uh, in order to check why these why these devices are stable we checked uh, we checked the fib analysis with respect to the different dopants uh, of the fresh samples and after 14 day samples and we found that the bare samples had the morphology or in uh, uh, compactness of the uh, compactness of the perovskite la layer has been uh, disturbed in the 
uh, in the bare sample. That means there is a iron, uh, iron or halide migration takes place uh, in the CSPB I2BR composition. However, uh, if I use the indium, uh, indium or europium, the morphology of the sample is intact. That means the doping uh, or partially replacement of the PB site with the europium or indium can terminate the iron migration, and that is the main reason to uh, that is the main reason for uh, improving the stability of the perovskite uh, inorganic perovskite solar cells. Then instead of the mesoporous TiO2, we have uh, used some uh, Mg Doppler Mg Doppler zinc uh, Mg Doppler zinc oxide and used as an electron transporting layer, and uh, uh, that uh, we used uh, um, as ETL and fabricated devices, and uh, that devices also exhibited uh, exhibited uh, more than 15% power conversion efficiency. If I check the stability of the bare zinc oxide and uh, Mg doppler zinc oxide, the stability of the Mg doppler or our modified method shows very uh, very high stability compared to the bare samples, and that also uh, that also uh, that also exhibit a uh, that also processed at a low temperature. That means we can use the low temperature processed. Uh, now, doped metal oxide in order to improve the stability as well as the efficiency of the inorganic perovskites. If I compare the stability, uh, if I compare the efficiency with respect to the different alternative ETLs, then I think uh, the Mg doped zinc oxide ETL shows very good efficiency, uh, which is processed in the ambient process and uh, uh, which is processed at low temperature as well as in an ambient condition. Uh, we uh, further we monitor the different uh, different halides with the different composition, and this is the time lapse. Uh, uh, we monitor the stability of the uh, perovskite thin films in an ambient condition at a high uh, high humidity, and you can easily check the uh, the optimum doping or optimum uh, p by p site replacement is. Uh, uh, that sample exhibit a very good stability. Yes, so you can check is a five percent sample shows very good uh, stability, very good uh, stability. And we also studied the different uh, dopant-free uh, hole transporting layer and that devices with the based on the our composition with the various dopant shows the uh, competitive efficiency. Then we checked the stability in a various uh, halides such as chlorine, bromine, iodine, and fluorine. But I believe that the chlorine-based uh, dopants are really stable. This is the more than 77% humidity. That means that devices are stable in uh, uh, high humidity condition. And this technique can be used for the fabrication of the perovskite model. Here, here we used a 10, 5 by 5 centimeter square area and is this uh, technique, the, the, our technique used for the fabrication of the perovskite, large area perovskite module. And you can easily check the, we can fabricate the large area even five by five, five by five centimeter. So, and most importantly, the, these devices are stable in ambient condition. We can process in the ambient condition and produce more than 10% at the module scale. So if I compare the stability and other techniques, our hot air method shows promising uh, efficiency. How much time we have? Hello, sir. Hello. Yes, yeah, sir. You can take 10 more minutes, sir. Ten okay, minutes. thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. I'm going to almost finishing the, <laughs> okay. So if I compare the efficiency with the respect to the conventional method and our modified method, then I can say that our modified method shows exhibit a very good efficiency, uh, which is processed in the ambient condition. Then if I check the, if I check the uh, energy payback time, uh, payback time of the uh, conventional so solar cell and the uh, perovskite perovskite tandem solar cell then i think the conventional solar silicon based solar cell shows uh, took almost 1.5 years but uh, in the perovskite perovskite tandem solar cell the it takes more than 0.3 years that means more than within a 3 months we can get the all 
uh, all money that we invested for the fabrication of the perovskite solar cell. That means the perovskite uh, solar cell are really low cost, uh, uh, low cost uh, photovoltaic technology. And this is, uh, uh, if I check the uh, greenhouse gas effect, uh, emission effect for the both the types, then perovskite solar cell shows really low uh, greenhouse uh, gas emission factor. That means uh, we, uh, we are also concerned about the uh, environmental pollution um, uh, for the fabrication of the, this type of photovoltaics. And I think the, uh, the perovskite perovskite fabrication is uh, eco-friendly and uh, low emission, uh, low carbon emission based. So we can use the different techniques for the fabrication of the uh, large area perovskite solar cell with the help of these uh, techniques we can fabricate. And uh, we can make the different uh, composition with the inorganic and organic to fabricate that perovskite perovskite tandem solar cell. And that can be upscale that we are current, currently uh, working on this aspect uh, and uh, soon we will get the good efficiency for the tandem. Uh, so there, uh, there is many challenges uh, for, the, for the fabrication or upscale the photovoltaics such as uh, improve the stability or improve the uh, efficiency and processing environment. That, uh, that is the unification challenge for in order to make the commercially available perovskite solar cell. So people are researchers, perovskite researchers are working on the different aspect, such as the development of whole transporting layer uh, or ETLs. And uh, with the help of the different uh, perovskite, we can make the highly stable and highly stable uh, efficient perovskite solar cell. And uh, uh, that the solar cell should survive at least 10 years, should be waterproof and uh, photostable, thermostable, uh, that we we uh, that researchers are tackling these issues in order to improve their efficiency as well as the stability. With the uh, with these uh, efforts, initially we started in 2012, uh, around 2000 uh, December 12, uh, with the zero percent efficiency. But currently we are reaching almost 23.7 percent conversion efficiency uh, in case of the uh, organic inorganic hybrid perovskite solar cell which is uh, very close to the world record. In case of the all inorganic perovskite solar cell, we started in 2016, uh, and now we are crossing the world record 17.4%, which is which, which is the higher, higher than the current world record for this composition. So our work is uh, highlighted in different, uh, different uh, cover pages. And finally, I would like to thank my professor Chang Kuk Hong for availing all facilities for fabrication of these devices. And uh, I would like to thank our uh, Korean uh, Research Fellowship uh, for awarding me the Korean Research Fellowship from 2016. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank there you. Are, there are some interesting questions, sir. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I'll just read out the questions mm -hmm. from uh, Professor Vinay Kadimule. Oh. If both anodic and cathodic perovskite NS is reactive, how to fabricate it during PV studies? Uh, could you please repeat once again? If both anodic and cathodic perovskite NS is reactive, how to fabricate it during perovskite uh, PV studies? Actually, anodic perovskite and uh, cathodic perovskite, there is another. Actually, perovskite is an intrinsic semiconductor. So I think the question is something <laughs> I, I, I don't know about this exactly. Cathodic perovskite and anodic perovskite, uh, this concept is not valid for the perovskite composition. <laughs> I'm sorry, I I, uh, I cannot answer this question. I don't know about the cathodic perovskite and anodic perovskite. Hello, sir. Hello.
हेलो हेलो हाँ वॉट इज द प्रॉब्लम हाँ 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 ओके ओके हाँ ओके ओके हाँ हेलो यस यस एम आई ऑडिबल यस 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 मैडम या ओके सर ओके सर वी शुड कंटिन्यू फ्रॉम हियर या ओके सो आई रीड द क्वेश्चन नेक्स्ट क्वेश्चन आई विल रीड ओके ओके नो प्रॉब्लम सो द क्वेश्चन इज एक्सप्लेन सम फिजिबल वेट केमिकल टेक्निक for fabrication of perovskite solar cells possible in india actually i am not getting exactly your Hello. voice is not audible actually could you please repeat once again okay sir i'll just i'll read it again sir yes yes please i'll read the question again yes sir i'll repeat explain yes, yes, yes. some feasible wet chemical te technique for fabrication of perovskite solar cells which can actually i am not getting exactly but i just heard the word the wet chemical something so yes actually perovskite solar cell is wet chemical process the yes wet chemical technique Yes, yes, yes. Actually, wet chemical oh, technique. Yes, yes, yes. Usually, this is a wet chemical process. Actually, we are using the some kind of the PBI two and uh, uh, MAI as a precur perovskite precursors, and which is dissolved in the DMA and DMSO solvent. And that solvent can be deposited uh, using the simple skin uh, spin coating technique, or uh, uh, using just uh, a drop casting. हेलो आई थिंक देर इज अ टेक्निकल प्रॉब्लम द ऑडियन कैन आस्क डायरेक्टली क्वेश्चन टू मी एक्चुअली आई डोंट नो देर इज अम टेक्निकल प्रॉब्लम हेलो 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 नंबर ऑडिबिलिटी प्रॉब्लम है हेलो ऑडियंस इज म्यूट मार्क पे क्लिक ऑप्शन पर क्लिक करो हेलो हां मैडम हां मैडम यस यस प्लीज गो अहेड योर वॉइस इज नाउ ऑडिबल फॉर मी हेलो आई विल रीड द क्वेश्चन 
Yes, sir. Okay, sir. So I'll read the question. Yes, sir. Yes, yes, yes. Sir, I'll, I'll repeat the question. Yes, yes. So you work on simulations of solar cells. Hmm. Do you work on the simulations of solar cells? Yeah, actually, we, we are not expert in the simulation, but uh, we are working, collaborating with uh, another group uh, from the UK, and uh, we are doing some DFT calculations based on the different composition. Currently, we are not working on the simulation. Okay, sir. And there are uh, uh, some more questions. Sir. Yes, yes. Uh, yes. Are there any method of finding PCE for such reactive NNP materials? PC or? If both NNP materials are reactive, PCE, finding PCE for materials where NNP are both reactive. Yes, yes. Actually, the uh, maybe the I'm not wrong. The he is asking about the P-type semiconductor and N-type semiconductor. I guess. So the whole mobility of the P-type semiconductor and uh, electron mobility of the ETL. That is most important parameters. That means actually the perovskite is intrinsic semiconductor. So that means we have to extract the electron and hole effectively from the perovskite layer. So these uh, P and N type is really affecting on the power conversion efficiency. Sir, next question. Sir, yes. next question. How, yes. about the stability, How about the stability in outer space? The stability, How about the stability in outer space high against high energy radiations? There is eco anyway. The outer space means uh, outside the uh, outside the earth or out in the ambient condition. If if he is uh, talking about the in uh, um, uh, ambient condition, currently we are st uh, we st uh, studied almost two years stability of the perovskite solar cell in ambient condition. And uh, in case of the outer space, uh, actually that is not our research area, but one of the Japanese scientists, they studied the outer space, they sent the perovskite device in the, their space lab and they studied and they, I think more than three years, they uh, studied the stability of that kind of perovskite, but that is not uh, our main topic. So they're asking about uh, outside earth, sir. Yes, yes, yes. Outside Earth, uh, currently few researchers, Japanese, especially Japanese researchers, out, outside the space they are studying. They sent the uh, perovskite devices outside the space and they studied and more than two years they, uh, they are successful to stabilize the perovskite devices in the outside the space. Generally in uh, perovskite, Leakage current density will be high due to large depletion layer. How to overcome it? Uh, actually, in in the in this case, the defect level is uh, can be reduced with the help of the only passivation and reduce the defects. So your deposition technique uh, is uh, playing a critical role in order to reduce that kind of losses. And uh, you can use also passivation technique. Such, can, such as the polymeric passivation with the different cations and uh, reduce the uh, defects level or grain boundaries. And uh, you can also use some kind of the additives such as, uh, such as uh, ionic liquid or uh, such as uh, uh, chloride or, or halide based uh, additives. So you can improve that kind, you can reduce that kind of leakages. But basically, the your film quality is should be as good as possible. That is the main key point in order to reduce that kind of losses. In case of MnO2 doped NS generally forms brown black surface on depletion over glass substrates, which uh, retard PEC. How to overcome it, sir? Uh, actually. 
Uh, he is talking about the MnO2. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. MnO2. Uh, as per as I know that the MnO2 is still not used in the perovskite uh, perovskite solar cell, but the uh, the main criteria is the if he is talking about ETL and HTL. If the MnO2, I think it's a P type semiconducting, but uh, the main issue is that the your ETL should be wide band gap semiconducting material. So you have to think about the uh, conduction band of the perovskite and the conduction band of the, your MnO2. If there is a band alignment, uh, so if the electron is flowing uh, in a right direction, then that can be used. But I, as per my knowledge, uh, still there is no any report based on the MnO2 because I think it's a low band gap semiconductor and it has a high recombination and the electron mobility is also very less. So at this moment, the MnO2 is not uh, good for the perovskites. Question, sir. Okay. Why the perovskite solar cell stability depends on power conversion efficiency where contradicts each other when power conversion efficiency is low, stability is high, or power conversion efficiency is high, then stability is low. Is it because of structure effect or uh, photoactive layer or any other things matters? Actually, there are many aspects in the perovskite composition. First one is uh, which composition you are going to use uh, and which, uh, which band gap. So band gap of that per particular perovskite is uh, main uh, main aspect in order to improve the efficiency of the perovskite solar cell. Suppose if by using the wide band gap semiconducting materials, I mean wide band gap perovskite, such as above, uh, above 1.9, the perovskite especially has a bromine content and bromine contents are highly stable, but that absorb the very limited energy, limited photon energy. In case of the low band gap, of course, they are highly efficient. But the especially SN and PB based uh, are low band gap and SN is continuously transformed into the SN2 plus to the SN4 plus. So the perovskite structure stabilization is the main issue nowadays. So people are trying to make stable as well as efficient perovskite. So that's it. Okay, sir. Uh, before concluding, I, Dr. Anita Nandurkar, would like to express my gratitude to everyone who are present in this meeting and those who are live on the YouTube channel. Respected Savan, sir, Principal KLIT, Dr. B.S. Anami, sir, Dean Academics, Sharad Joshi, sir, our most valuable participants, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of Kelly Institute of Technology, Hubali, the entire team of Department of Physics, and on my own behalf, I extend a very hearty thanks to our today's speaker, Dr. Savan Sir, for gracing his knowledge and sharing with us his findings and opinions. Perovskites have been a hot research topic for the past 10 years, but we really got to know much more about these materials. My hearty thanks to our beloved principal, Dr. B.S. Anami sir, for the support and guidance he has extended. I also extend my thanks to our Dean Academics, Dr. Sharaji Joshi sir, for his enormous cooperation in the organization of this event. We received overwhelming response from the participants all across the country, more than 20 states, and also outside the country with participants from USA, Algeria, South Korea, Tunisia, and many other countries. 
So with deep sense of appreciation, I thank all the participants for their enthusiasm and cooperation. My special thanks are due to participants from outside India. I thank heads of various departments, my colleagues and research scholars of our institute who have joined us in this meeting. An event like this cannot happen overnight. The wheels start rolling weeks ago. It requires planning and a bird's eye for details. We have been fortunate enough to be backed by a team of motivated and dedicated colleagues, Dr. P.S. Pati and Dr. S.N. Mathur and our lab instructor, Mr. Ventesh Kulkarni, who need that job. Thank you, Pati sir, Mathur sir, and Ventesh. I would fail in my duty if I forget to thank Mr. Banchandra Chikko, Assistant Professor, Department of Computer Science, KLITUB, and Mr. Mantesh for technical support provided by them in arranging this Zoom meeting as well as for the live streaming in YouTube. Thank you, Balchandra sir and Mante sir. Once again, I thank all the participants for being with us in this virtual meeting and of course for the patient hearing. Thank you one and all. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, thank you very much. The feedback link has been shared in both the YouTube as well as the chat box. Participants can fill the feedback link before two o'clock in the afternoon. Thank you. Okay, thank you everyone. Shall we exit the meeting, sir? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you. you thank you. Thank you, everyone.